Now looking at the next digital transformation era, it's really clear to see that blockchain, smart contracts and Web3 have played a really key role. But where are the trends moving forward and what can you expect when riding the next digital transformation wave? If we fast forward a little bit into MetaMask as it stands today, it currently has in 2022, 21 million monthly active users. Okay, even on my Twitter right now, I say it was the inception of a circus. Um, I initiated contact with the SEC. Um, the SEC basically said you know what we have is written on our website like we don't really need to spend any extra effort on this you know leave us alone that it was it was it wasn't the best conversation i'm still on good terms basically with with everyone except maybe joe lubin because i think joe lubin wants to give me as little as metamask tokens as possible or something powered by fluid the world's first Web3 bank alternative. Hello and welcome to Tech from the Top. Joining me in the studio, I have Joel Dietz, who was a founding member of both Ethereum and also a founding architect of Metamask. We're going to be diving into how you can make the most of the future digital trends. Now, before we go any further, I would like to thank the sponsors of today's video, Fluid Finance. The easiest way to on and off ramp from your traditional bank account into a Web3 wallet like Metamask. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing fabulous, yeah. Now, looking into your background, it was so fascinating because I actually read somewhere that you started computer programming or learning to at the age of six, if that was correct. Yeah, that's basically correct. Yep. So I would love to dive into a little bit more of your background first, and then we'll go into kind of where you see the future of Web3 and the metaverse, starting off with when you first kind of rolled out into blockchain integration, Ethereum is a big name that stands out when looking at your career history. Talk us through some of the kind of the conceptual conversations that you had at that point in your life when you were familiar with the Ethereum team. Uh, I'm assuming it was based out of London. Uh, no, I was kind of mobile at that time. I had mm -hmm. just come from Berlin to California and I had basically a failed startup that was itself an early digital currency startup but I had built um, a micropayment digital currency, like uh, extension and payment system. And uh, yeah, that, that was part of what led to MetaMask actually later on was kind of seeing the opportunity around like digital currency and browser extensions. So it started with, I guess, you identifying a gap in the market or a problem, and then you looking to kind of build on that with MetaMask. Um, well, sort of, you know, sometimes, you know, the technology first and what it can enable. And sometimes, you know, the customer needs first. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you see like the gaps as well with the kind of user experience or, you know, uh, when we did the Y Combinator, um, interview for the project that basically became MetaMask later on, uh, they basically said, we don't know why people would use Ethereum at all. So the Y Combinator people weren't convinced that Ethereum at all was going to be a thing. Obviously, those of us who were kind of on the team at, the po at that point were very convinced and already working on it full time. But mm -hmm. And how big was the team at that point? There were just uh, really three of us at that particular moment, um, uh, plus a kind of designer who was working very peripherally. And uh, it was, you know, really only one of the pe person, the person who kind of continued was really working on it full time. Other person was working full time for the Ethereum Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, partially by virtue of being a community organizer for many years, you bring people together, you run events, you know, you have. And, and in order to do that well, and it's a sort of challenging thing to do well. It's, it's also a challenging thing to like monetize because a lot of people don't appreciate the effort necessarily that goes into that. Um, but you spend a lot of time basically bringing a lot of different people together from different walks of life and then seeing where kind of, you know, good synergies might be. So, uh, so if we focus more on the kind of the Ethereum side, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. so many projects have been built on that moving forward and so many smart contracts have evolved from mm -hmm. what you guys as a concept have built. When there are so many different minds in the room and you're brainstorming, was it hard for you guys to really move forward in a way if there was so much that could be done? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm really thankful. I mean, I think Vitalik led it in basically the right direction. You know, he's obviously a very um, bright person and kind of, you know, a lot of sort of parallel implementations, worked on getting the op codes right and the very, like, basic fundamental stuff. Um, I did, uh, you know, I, I am not really a assembly level kind of programmer type of person. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I, I could have learned it at that point, but I already had a pretty successful career in the software industry before that. 
And so the type um, of kind of engagement that I had at that time was more on the educational side of kind of educating people about the potential of what these things could do and sort of developer evangelism more broadly. Um, but I'm very thankful because I, I spent some time at, at the moment like writing down, I think, 83 different use cases for smart contracts and all different things you could do. And I circled the ones I thought were the most valuable and also the ones that were most exciting. You know, DAOs is something that people were talking about then uh, quite a lot. And then it, you know, didn't, no one talked about it for a couple of years and people talked about it when the DAO launched and then that sort of exploded and then people didn't talk about it for a while and people are quite excited about DAOs again. So, you know, some of these things are a little bit cyclical and people get excited about them. I've, I've had a pretty steady level of excitement for many of them uh, over the years, despite, despite knowing that like some of them are more conceptual and some of them are more like, okay, like I can make my own coin and print my own coin and then, you know. Has there been any of the 83 that haven't yet made it to market? Um, a lot of them, actually, because uh, I would say maybe even half of them were things that required some kind of legal and regulatory, you know, integration points. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been one of the most difficult things by far, because uh, I would say kind of the anarchist roots of like blockchain stuff. But basically, people were going very hard to make things uncensorable and not be something that governments could interfere with. Um, but at the same time, those design principles make it very hard to integrate any existing kind of rule of law. And so if I want to take this table in front of us and tokenize it and sell fractional ownership, that's still basically an unsolved problem at this point. I mean, I and many other people have talked about this over many years, but it, basically no one's quite figured out where and how to do that properly. And you mentioned the regulatory side of things as well. I'm curious because you are very active in the kind of crypto event scene. You mentioned is that the community meetups back in the day. Have there been any times where you have been in the rooms with either regulators or kind of different jurisdictions and maybe they're trying to understand a little bit more about what you're building as it's rolling out? Yeah, I think I was maybe the first person in the room with both the SEC and possibly the FCA in the UK as well on some of these topics. Um, I initiated contact with the SEC because we ran a conference at kind of Harvard, MIT on some of these topics and which now bridge into this computational law initiative that was there. And um, I was hoping for engagement. You know, I would hope that they would sit down with all these legal scholars, the, the scholars uh, and some people, for example, involved, uh, evolved into organizations like Coin Center were very interested and engaged and participating quite actively. Um, SEC basically said you know what we have is written on our website like we don't really need to spend any extra effort on this you know leave us alone so um yeah I, I mean i think maybe there's been a few kind of proactive elements since then but it was it, was, it wasn't the best conversation what year was that roughly do you remember that was january 2015 okay wow so very yeah. very early on mm -hmm. okay so now if we fast forward a little bit into MetaMask as it stands today, it currently has in 2022, 21 million monthly active users. How was the first onboarding process for getting that first wave of adoption, the first 50,000 people that are kind of activating their, their wallets? You know, I think it really goes into the dedicated engineering effort that goes into building these things and optimizing it for user experience, which, you know, really I wasn't responsible for. I don't want to take credit for where it's not due. I mean, there's a just in general building these products, there's there's a huge amount of things that go through. I was like a, even on my Twitter right now, I said it was the inception officer because, you know, sometimes you come up with an idea. It's a very compelling idea and you recruit a, uh, a team around it or kind of get it some initial momentum. But what takes it into being like a product that people can use is so much more, obviously, uh, beyond that sort of initial sort of inception. Um, but uh yeah, I mean, I think there there was and remains to this day a very strong, core, early active group of Ethereum, dedicated Ethereum people um, that really still see it as kind of the future and are kind of dedicated to kind of you know, rolling out this larger vision um, and, and kind of revolving around Vitalik as a figure as well, because I think Vitalik has been very consistent, you know, in his intellectual rigor and efforts and despite a plethora of other projects that are basically ethereum imitators you know they got the idea from ethereum they're building some kind of other smart contract system or some other kind of variant on, on the sort of technology things the fact is that you know the developer community and intellectual community around ethereum 
remains extremely strong and and probably the strongest, you know, to this day, despite, you know, a lot of other people who've gone out, including several of Ethereum founders who now kind of have their own. And do you still have open communication with some of the core team as well and just kind of see what they're looking ahead into building and, and just touch base regularly? Um, yeah, I think a lot of the sort of people that were on the board in the very beginning um, did not particularly get along with each other well afterwards. It's kind of interesting. Um, but in general, I'm in contact with all of them um, uh, and friendly contact, frankly, um, but not super close. I wouldn't necessarily say any of us really made our way to being like close friends, but I'm, you know, I'm still on good terms basically with with everyone except maybe Joe Lubin because I think Joe Lubin wants to give me as little as MetaMask tokens as possible or something, but that, you know, is what it is. And is there any of them that you find that you're most in line with your with your vision, with their vision? Is there any that you kind of, you both have a similar direction with what you're building uh, now? One of them I kind of lost touch with, but I've attempted to reach out with from the beginning was the editor of Bitcoin magazine, uh, Mihai, who, you know, was very involved with Ethereum and kind of a similar kind of like social vision, you know, really like what is the ability of these kind of smart contracts to build kind of communities and allow for you know, a lot about like reputational systems and some of, I would say like, not exactly necessarily in what most people mean by like progressive kind of things, but kind of setting up new types of communities um, and, uh, and building out new types of kind of like low level infrastructure, um, even around like agriculture, or other things like that. Uh, so I always found that very compelling. That was definitely one of the things that got me very engaged in the early thing. Not that I necessarily had it figured out, um, all of the details of it. Um, and in general, I respect, you know, the other things. I mean, I think both Cardano and Polkadot have, you know, healthy communities. I like kind of very occasionally have contacts with both, you know, Charles and Gav. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, um, and, you know, Vitalik less often, but, you know, still occasionally. Nice. Okay. So when we fast forward to kind of today, where we stand currently, you're also the founder of Meta Metaverse. Mm -hmm. So talk us through that as an organization and what kind of things you are rolling out, because it seems like it's very encompassing of everyone being able to build their own metaverse reality, if that's correct. Yeah. I mean, one analogy, you know, you might use this kind of mid journey or some of these other AI things where people basically be able to take stuff and then kind of bring your ideas or Dali and just write something out and then basically have, you know, images generated. And our goal was basically to enable the same type of thing for metaverses. But instead of just being, you know, a 2D flat image, you get a 3D interactive world, basically, that it reflects, you know, kind of what you would uh, like to have in that. And, um, and also allows you to kind of build things inside of it, invite your friends, um, have different kind of gaming experiences or things that kind of reflect um, you. And there's, you know, a mix of the different audiences like that. You know, obviously like Roblox is, and Minecraft are probably the two most successful things that are in that genre today. They most cater to a younger audience. They're very participation and kind of community oriented. Um, and I think that's kind of where we want to be as well. Just really like, you know, focused on the kind of user experience and onboarding things. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes the Web3 stuff can cut against that because the and we've debated this quite a bit internally because the, you know, inherent speculative nature of kind of virtual land and then the market dynamics. And then it also just in general caters to a much older audience. And so it's very hard to like satisfy both audiences at the same time. So, um, but yeah, in general, there's, you know, gaming is a very, very healthy market. So do you think, as you've mentioned there, Roblox is a good example of it's kind of the generations of 12 to 16. It's really active. So we might just see as people grow into Roblox. So as the 16 year olds become 18 and then the 18 year olds become 25, that's how we'll see adoption of these kind of worlds. But as you've mentioned there with the likes of Sandbox, for example, and Virtual Land, that's a larger audience, which one... Is it kind of a race between the two? Is there competition between these two subdivisions of metaverse worlds? Yeah, I would say the way they're set up right now is almost like they're two incompatible worlds. Mm -hmm. And uh, and maybe there's a race between them. But I mean, for me, it's not much of a race because at least from the most kind of standard metrics that I would use to assess success, it's really these Roblox platforms that are kind of you know winning and have that kind of engagement. Um, not to say that I have anything against the other ones. You know, I talk with... You know, the Animoca and Sandbox team quite frequently and in general think they they have really, you know, good vision for what they want to do. 
Um, but you know, the, there's just, you know, the, the very different models effectively. So if we paint the picture then how you would see, for example, in 2025 users encompassing metaverse applications maybe in a more frequent use case than we have now, what would that look like? What would it, would it look like kind of online retail moving on to the metaverse? What kind of things would you expect to see? Yeah, I mean, what I would expect to see, frankly, you know, is maybe different from what other people have said. But, you know, it, it, a lot of people say that the social media, the kids don't use the same platform as their parents use. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a similar type of dynamic that basically like no older audience, frankly, is ever going to adopt metaverse for anything except for maybe very small niches. Like Second Life, which is kind of the original metaverse, is a lot of people don't realize it's still very active metaverse and it just caters to kind of very sort of niche audiences um, that, you know, maybe don't have the same types of place to like congregate in real life. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that will exist, but broadly speaking, and to some degree, even crypto people who are like the real diehard enthusiasts, you know, sort of qualify as a, as a niche audience in some level. But yeah, the future will go to like the, you know, next Snapchat, the next kind of thing that really people find engaging around the kind of types of, you know, user experiences that people have. So, and that kind of thing, it depends on what you mean by metaverse too, because a lot of people think, oh, it's like a 3D immersive world and virtual reality. And I'm going to have a headset. And I think that's, in some ways, I would say it's not interesting, but it's less interesting than many of the other like things that people are doing. And even all of these like a avatar stuff like Instagram and Snapchat and all these sort of standard things, they have concepts of avatars already. Filters are basically a type of avatar. You can kind of create version of yourself. They've obviously been getting more complex over time where you can see yourself as like a granny. You can see yourself in you know, the 15th century and clothing. You know, you're basically able to create these projections of yourself. Um, in various contexts and yeah I think in general they're going to become more 3D and whatever else um, but it, I, I don't necessarily think that the best use cases for them are the replacements for the physical things it's more the things that are kind of augmenting our existing day-to-day -day experience. Got it and it seems like I can imagine based on your experience, you've sat in the room and been part of some really interesting conversations, not just with people that are already in this digital tech industry, but with kind of large organizations or maybe even different jurisdictions that are looking to kind of not miss out on this next digital wave. So is there any kind of conversations that you've had with different jurisdictions, countries, organizations that are going, you know, we want to be part of this next digital future how do we do that or maybe they come to you with ideas what kind of things have you heard that have stood out for you we have had let's say three or four significant state level conversations um with uh, ministers and things of that nature and at the moment i can't honestly tell you if these people are really going to adopt in a meaningful way or if it's either a post or anything or there will just be kind of too much internal bureaucracy for them to kind of really do something uh which is part of the reason you know i'm always open to these type of conversations and phone calls and things like that um but you know there is a fair bit of work in you know getting something you know nice up and running obviously and doing the kind of modeling and then um similarly and i actually answered this question at the world government summit uh, here in dubai recently you know what should we do to get people more engaged in civic responsibility and engagement and i pretty much always say the same thing but you know it's uh, and that is you know make it feel more like a game you know feel it make it feel like more like an interactive kind of fun experience <laughs> rather than like a social responsibility you know like you must go and do this um and but those are you know it's not necessarily that easy to go out and just you know make something like that happen Mm -hmm. um uh, and also there's just barriers like it, as another example like one community i'm excited about is called scratch three it's a children's programming language basically a community very active community around it and kind of pretty good introduction into the world of kind of programming um but you know there's a lot of countries that just don't teach their kids how to use computers at all or really have that integrated in the educational program 
And so, yeah, in theory, those kids can go out independently and, you know, jump in the metaverse and start building things. And, you know, they're obviously the, the Minecraft doesn't require necessarily the governments to care about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I do hope, you know, for the sake of children everywhere that more governments do take these things sort of seriously and integrate them into their sort of standard educational programs. But um, I don't think that we can make our success basically completely dependent on whether, whether or not and when these institutions kind of move. Yeah. And would you say it's something that maybe parents could also kind of encourage or is it like if governments aren't on board in different areas then it's going to be really difficult? Oh, no, I think it's uh, in some ways more parent and kid driven than anything else at the end of the day and, and kind of community too. Like there's so many cool communities um, popping up all the time. I mean, even like Synthesis, which was kind of the spin out of this, uh, you know, SpaceX kind of founder school. It's now, you know, raise the series A. We've had some communication with them, but, you know, it's very cool. You know, you take these kids and basically put them in, you know, their own little bubble. They actually call the first class of students the Martians because they want them to be okay. like the, they're kind of thinking that they might be the first people to set physical foot on Mars. And so it's like kind of part of the concept behind the whole thing. Is this the Elon Musk school that his, his children are part of a class the, of 20? The, yeah, there are a couple different schools that okay. came out of the things. This is one of them. Yeah. And uh, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit because I have friends who's basically kids are in this. I'm still a hopeful parent, but not an actual parent. Um, at the moment. So I, I get to see a little bit about the kind of curriculum choices and things like that. And it's just very exciting, you know, so. Um, that is interesting because it seems like the education system didn't really have a revamp since the 1960s, 1970s, let's say. So do you feel like it's finally accelerated the 50 years that it needed to? And this is a good example of it. I think these are like tiny little pockets, you know, and I really hope that something, you know, and I mean, Elon Musk is a pretty good track record of taking things mainstream. I don't know how active he is with this particular educational thing, but, you know, I do hope certainly that some of these things get going and that, you know, jurisdictions, you know, that want to be on, let's say, the progressive end of things will, will you know, take this stuff seriously, but I don't know. And we talked about kind of education maybe being left behind and now uh, people like Elon Musk are trying to play catch up. And I do think with MetaMask and what you've built, it was the banking industry and the industry of kind of online digital wallets was very much light years behind. And then MetaMask and what was created with Web3 wallets really accelerated things forward. What would you say for the next wave of adoption with maybe banking and how to incorporate banking with Web3 wallets in a more streamlined way? What would you expect? Because that's something that you would expect to happen with country jurisdiction banks. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of banks that are, you know, maybe finally sort of getting the message and, and some very, you know, great ones out there that uh, are really kind of learning the right way of kind of integrating, you know, sort of some of these Web3 things. Obviously, there's a lot of, you know, custodial risks. There's, you know, risk in other people's sort of collateralization ra uh, ratios and sort of how they have their sort of backup set up. So we've seen, you know, some of these default mar DeFi markets fall, fall out because, um, but I think that, you know, I think the progress is in a very good direction and kind of integrating these things and, into the existing banking industry. And there's a lot of potential there. And um, I think MetaMask did a really good job as well of almost renaming some of the processes. I know there was a rename from a previous phrase to seed phrase was also a way to kind of help make it more easy, user explainer friendly for people that are looking to enter in. So 21 million users currently what do you think it would take to get to the next 100 use 100 million users uh, well you know i don't know if this is true for metamask specifically i haven't really been involved in managing metamask but i do think it's true for what we're doing and i think basically gaming is to, is the route for you know both onboarding younger audiences um and the rest of it, and I think one of the challenges there, though, and it's a very large challenge, is winning the trust. And interestingly enough, I was reading the sort of Y Combinator, you know, rejection of MetaMask, and then called Vapor at the time, about, you know, basically one of the things they did say is, you know, we're not really sure what is really going to cause people to trust these things. Like, what is the, the nature of the trust that you will have? And even from what I've seen, uh, you know, there's a lot of deceit you know in certain areas in, in web3 or, or just things that are over marketed or the you know things aren't quite there um so and it makes it a, a very challenging thing really to like know who to trust even to this day um so i think the people that solve that 
will you know rise to the top but eventually you know it's still sometimes a, a thing because uh, to figure out quite how to do it um successfully and, and and gaming is interestingly enough a very good way of, of having an entry point there um because you know it's not necessarily about like are you lying to me or telling me the truth i mean sure we can you can get into that or something like that or is your assets actually there or what's your real you know the whole celsius thing or anything but you can just say like is this a good user experience you know is this fun to play like you know and you're basically customizing it around a kind of particular type of application and um, for me, I have, you know, tons of experience in different forms of gaming as well. Um, you know, board games and card games and you know, computer games and, you know, math games and all, the, all of it. And you can really tell the difference between the people who put it, the, you know, the work into the kind of user experience and really the engagement, especially when you're in a physical location with someone, because uh, I've, I've actually designed way more um, physical games than I have computer games, interestingly enough. And uh, But you can kind of see the emotional response of people as they're playing the game and how they get engaged. And it's very gratifying as well. So um i i'm quite fortunate um in some ways now that i had a very serendipitous moment i was um at harvard recently and uh, and this professor um who was there uh went to me in the harvard art museum which in itself is like it's in a cube basically kind of structure it's like empty space and our meta metaverse platform is designed by like being subdivided into cubes and it turned out that this guy who who i had never met before was the inventor of a whole class of games basically called gnomic um, which is kind of famous within the sort of gaming community about certain types of games where the rules of the game evolve. Um, so he became, you know, quite involved in our, in our, in the design aspects of certain things of the project. And I don't know, it's just, it's, it's a joy basically to kind of design mm -hmm. around these kind of principles because it's also a thing too. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of technology, but there's actually, I don't know, it's kind of like certain types of things like music and mathematics I would say they're like kind of more eternal, you know, but they kind of like they, they last in your mind. They have a legacy. They kind of stick. People can remember them from for generations. You know, if you really achieve something sort of, you know, significant in those areas, whereas, you know, technology and I hate to say this even because I said good things about Elon Musk already. Yeah. But you don't really know like how Elon Musk is going to be remembered in 20 years or what are the real legacy? Like is SpaceX really going to make it to Mars? I don't know. It depends on what, you know, how much weed, you know, whatever, whatever other drugs like Elon Musk is doing or something like that in the next five years. Like there's no real guarantee that they're going to make it there. Um, and even if they do, it's not really clear, it would, you know, it will be necessarily Elon Musk who gets to put his flag there first or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, whereas some of these other things, I feel like they're somehow more deeply woven into the nature of human consciousness. Um, so anyway, so it makes me really excited to continue working on these things. And this is why, is this why Meta, Metaverse is one of the main projects that you're really interested in right now because it does kind of mix history of user flow as like a kind of historian by nature and also the art element. It encompasses these features also with technology. So it kind of builds on everything. Um, well, it's a good question. Um, I think, yeah, I think it is a combination, basically, because it's like a full form sort of platform and toolkit for building, you know, at these, you know, multiple levels. And as a result, um, you know, the, it, it feeds, I guess you could say, the, the soul or the different elements that, you know, bring us into our own kind of creative flow and the things that we can do. So, you know, in a, a Minecraft thing, I mean, it might be a bit of a stretch to call it like art, you know, per se. But I have, well, even last night I was looking at some amazing, you know, music videos that were done in Minecraft or something like that. So it has a, a huge amount of like creative output in addition to the gaming thing that engages people and things like that. And yeah, I think we aim to be in that same kind of category where the, the tools are there for people to create, you know, the vision that, you know, they want to bring into the world. So. And is there anything that you can look into the future if we had a crystal ball that could potentially be a blocker for how you see the industry heading, something that might disrupt that or get in the way? Um, well, I think there is a huge sort of danger in general. And I mentioned around DAOs earlier, like 
everyone was enthusiastic about you know DAOs in 2014, 15 when you know Ethereum first launched and when the DAO launched and you know whatever thing. But then people, something bad happens and then people you know get scared of something and then basically the whole interest level in that particular thing. Right now, Meta because of its renaming and because they're just dumping a ton of money into it. Um, is sort of grabbing the microphone around some of the metaverse stuff. And in fact, I even just saw like Tim Cook was like, we don't really care about the metaverse. We care about you know, AR or something like that. So it, it is, it's partially a definitional problem because I'm sure that I would define, um, you know, metaverse different from Tim Cook. But at least today, Tim Cook has like more, let's say, hearers and followers than I do. Uh, so I can't necessarily get other people to adopt sort of my definition for metaverse and the more inclusive uh, version uh, that I would use. So in that sense, you know, we may need to even ourselves, you know, within a kind of platform technology, find a niche that we're very, very good at and continue to build out of that niche. And then, you know, you know potentially even not use the word metaverse if people aren't caring about it for a while while, while we continue to build our sort of larger vision. So what would your definition be? If you had to give like a one sentence. Um, I always say the bridge to the unseen worlds and it kind of goes into these creative things or imagination and the stuff that we were talking about. But like if I'm imagining, you know, this, you know, beautiful scene of the Eiffel Tower with these, you know, floating pink clouds and rainbows or whatever else. And I want to describe that to you. You know, the verbal description may get so far if you don't know what the Eiffel Tower is, then I may need to get a pen and paper and try to draw or describe um, but there's various communication mechanisms like showing you a photo or, you know, putting a VR headset on you that would then allow you to experience the scene much more easily. And so it's basically my way of like getting from inside my mind to inside your mind. Um, so and, and that's true, you know, for really creative things like we're talking about the artistic, you know, whatever, you know versions but it's also true for a lot of other things like we're talking about education like you know computational biology chemistry like molecules like if i want to describe like what a particular molecule looks like it's going to take me a lot longer to draw it it's going to take me a lot longer to try to verbally explain it and so these type of um yeah communication mechanisms but it's like maybe a little bit of a philosoph philosophical definition but i think um when you think about metaverse in some ways as like communication mechanism, it actually opens up a lot of possibilities that you might not think about otherwise. Yeah. I like that you've painted a picture there for the user and people that aren't already in tech can understand and identify with how you just described it. The architecture behind it, though, sounds like it must be enormous. How much of a demand are you expecting there to see from people that ha are able to contribute to this future kind of metaverse reality that we're going to see? Um, I think that it will be very accessible. Um, and, you know, part of that is, you know, even the voice integration or the things that we're talking about, Dali, like these things are quite accessible now. It's, I mean, the technology behind it is actually quite hard to understand. But then if you just say, like, I want, a, you know, a wolf with a pink tomato on his head, you know, they, these AI algorithms can pull it together and draw it for you and everything else. So I think we'll be there, you know, uh, maybe a year, two years or something. But yeah, I think we'll be there quite soon. Wow, that's really soon, actually. So you mentioned a few times in this education is really important. So for people that are watching, just as a final recap, is there one resource or recommendation that you can give people to go, you know what, this will really help you if you're still struggling to overcome the concept of where we're moving forward when it comes to incorporating this new technology, this will help you get it or this will help you be ahead of the curve or understand it a bit better. Um, well, we do give out sort of access. We have a sort of private beta going on. We do give that out to certain, you know, people who have particular use cases for it, for the meta metaverse. Um, so that's always kind of one option. Um, but uh, in general, I encourage people to, to try out the different, you know, platforms that are out there uh, and including the sort of crypto ones we talked about a little bit Um and just to sort of VR stuff in general. And then like the one of the things that I think is always really a cool experience that I used to do when like getting people going in VR um, was like Tilt Brush and some of these 3D art apps. Because it also just gives you a sense of like the creative possibility of being immersed in a kind of 3D space 
um, right right off the bat. And and there's like a certain you know type of expressiveness that kind of could get unlocked there that um, isn't yeah no, that ever, some people might miss if they had never experienced it before. It's certainly such an exciting time, and I like the one to two year benchmark that you've put on it because it's like sounds like it's very much here and it's just wait and see for people to be able to use it as a use case joel thank you so much for coming in today it's always great to catch up but this is definitely extremely insightful so really appreciate your time yeah pleasure thank you so much thank you guys so much for watching as well and don't forget to subscribe to not miss any more content like this